before we invest, we ask what the goals are. It's just like I said, should I buy gold? Should I buy silver? Should I hedge? What should I do? We gotta know what our goals are. And for me, I, I separate this the beginning level for three different goals. And so it kinda you and this is where we now shift to a personal fundamental analysis. Now we're gonna talk about what your policy is. Now we're gonna talk about what you own. Because as an investor, we have to do all three. We've got to know sovereign, because everything that happens happens in the shadow of the sovereign. Debt to GDP ratio, foreign sovereign debt, European debt printing money inflation okay well that affects corporate well we got to know what we're buying corporately what are we getting value what's the growth and do we want income or do we want growth what do we want so let's start with real estate you know if I'm selling my house I'm gonna have a capital gain or a capital loss maybe you're like Armando Montalago you want to be a house flipper maybe you're like Robert Kiyosaki you want to buy the house hold it for cash flow I'll bet Armando's probably flipped a thousand houses. Robert Kiyosaki's bought two thousand houses. He bought twenty five hundred houses plus five golf courses. So one guy is flipping them, and he's getting rich and becoming a millionaire by buying low, selling high, buying low, selling high, buying low, selling high. Guy like Robert, he's on his way to becoming. You know, he's going to be a billionaire someday. Trump is a billionaire because they buy and hold and rent, buy and hold and buy, 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 buy. They never sell. They buy it and let it appreciate and hang on to it. So different philosophies, both will get you rich, what, which one do you want to do? So we're going to flip the house, we're going to rent the house. Or do we want to spend some money to insure our, our nest egg here? So in my mind, those are the three things you want to do. None are better than the other. I respect all three. Hey, I've flipped houses. I've also got houses I hold for cash flow. I have insurance on all my houses. What are our goals? Well, let's take, do real estate and we'll do stock. If we look at the fundamental analysis, we can look at different parts of it, and the heart's the financial statement. So if you're going for a capital gain, that'll increase your assets, either going to increase in value, or maybe you have a housing bubble that decreases in value. Well, assets minus, minus liabilities net worth. So when you go for a capital gain, you know, then you're either going to have it go up in value, down in value, your net worth changes. So you ask yourself as you do your personal fundamental analysis, what do I need? Do I need to increase my net worth? If I want to increase my net worth, maybe I buy some capital gain stocks and buy some growth stock. Okay, right here, cash flow. No, I'm, I'm not focused on uh, this one. I'm focused on the, the cash flow, right? I need income to live on each month. And that's my favorite because that's what will help you retire. Net worth doesn't help you retire. Cash flow does. That's an important distinction to make. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Hedging, that's just a liability. I'm not expecting anything back from that money. I'm just buying something, so if the house burns down, I cover it. You know, in, in, in Robert Kiyosaki's latest book, uh, you know, The Unfair Advantage, The Power of Financial Education, what you'll never, what they'll never teach you, you know, about school, never teach you about money in school, um, he asked me about this. And I say the biggest difference between professionals and amateurs is amateurs are always going for the capital gain. Professionals go for cash flow. Amateurs are always, you know, trying to hedge or trying to protect themselves with diversifying, and yet professionals use contracts like insurance. So if this were stocks, we could do the same thing. Some people want to buy Apple, you know, and buy at 300. You know, maybe you sell it at 600. Well, now your net worth's gone up. You have more money than you did before. But maybe you want a dividend stock where you buy the thing and then it just pays you as long as you own the stock, as long as they declare a dividend. One of the things you got to realize is that this does not solve, right here, this does not solve the problem. And this is where 401ks are, right? Your, your value or your mutual funds go up and down. Very rarely are you taking a dividend out of that now. It's usually reinvested in for more growth to buy more stuff into the fund. So uh, a mutual fund generally is not a cash flow thing. There are some that are, but most, most 401ks, you're not drawing money each month. Your net worth is going up and down. Well, understand this. Someday, we got to have cash flow. Look, catch this. If you have a nut to crack, let's put it in red. Let's say you got a $4,000 nut to crack each month. You know, well, having your net worth go up and down isn't really going to matter. You need what? You need to pay this bill every month. So what income-producing assets do is they produce cash that help crack this nut. 
if you can get four thousand dollars in cash flow coming from assets see most people get it from a job out here and the job is is putting in the money you can get rid of the job if you have the assets that are producing the same cash so you might do it this way wealth equals that's not a very good w well let's do that over we got to do that right it's that important right wealth let's make a really good w i know i'm using my mouse so it's hard to do it nice wealth is when your passive income right and there's two types of income active income is if you're making let's say you got a four thousand dollar nut to crack if you're making four grand at your job right that's called an active income we don't want that but if you're making four grand from your assets right that's called passive income if your passive income is greater than your expense number in other words if you can get this to five thousand you know then you don't need this job anymore so i believe the key to wealth is cash flow maybe we could look at it this way maybe what we might say is that is that net worth if a guy has a high net worth he's rich okay r for rich but if the guy has a passive income above his expenses then he's independently wealthy in other words he has enough wealth that he's independent from having to work you could be rich and still have to work you could have a high net worth and still not be able to pay your bills you have a huge 401k you could have a million dollars in your 401k and still not be able to still have to retire because you're young or what have you so what 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 I like what I don't like about a 401k is that it affects net worth what I like about income producing assets is they is when they produce cash flow so I think you know one of the reasons I wrote the book 401 chaos is people don't understand that they don't understand that they're trying to grow their net worth and the sad thing is is often 401ks what can they do well they can go down right and so your net worth goes down but let's say you have a stock like a P&G you know the cash value of that of that might go up and down okay but if their dividend keeps getting paid you know maybe the the price of the stock goes down but that dividend is still coming in consistent right so that's that's kind of the difference between between those and there's other ways as we talk about cash flow it's not just about dividends guys i got a whole we're going to do a whole class just on cash flow so what we're doing is we're looking at a personal financial statement now, right? What area do you need to focus on? You need net worth, you need cash flow, what do you need? And and we're going to work on buying assets and stocks to help fill those needs. I buy a lot of of stuff just for insurance. You know, when we do when we do risk risk management, the risk class, we'll talk about put options. We buy an option to hedge some risk and preserve capital. So all kinds of stuff uh preserve our assets. So all kinds of stuff we do here um you know with with our assets how do I find stuff this is using technology now you're gonna you're I would imagine that you're gonna want to do this in a in a cool way and be a little bit more professional so I use technology yeah you can do the, the Yahoo finance thing and all this that's cool but but for example here's some technology now this uh, is called fundamental score you'll notice here that there's this green thumb well that means it's gone through all the numbers already it's gone through the earnings the growth the revenue and it tells me is this fundamentally solid you know is this blockbuster video is it threatened to go out of business hey it could but the fundamentals say this looks pretty strong right now and i can look if i want to short the market as we'll talk about i might find red thumbs with weak companies that are going out of business i could short them for uh, for a bit of a capital gain so that's kind of cool. I can search for different criteria. For example, if you look closely on this one, you know, look closely, this one right here says that I'll circle it. If you can't read it, that's this fundamental score. So there's 67 in the software I use. There's 67 different things I can look for. One of those things is how strong are they fundamentally? How strong is their fundamental analysis? So see, I could go through all 14,000 stocks. I could go to Yahoo Finance, which is free, and I could type in Apple and compare it, then P&G, then compare it, then Microsoft, then compare it, then Philip Morris and compare it, and just go through all these stocks one at a time and compare. That takes 14,000 stocks. Or I can say, hey, just go find the ones with the most solid fundamental analysis or the weakest fundamental analysis, fetch, and go get them for me. Here I've sorted by fundamental analysis. See all the green thumbs? Boop, 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 the best of the best. So I can organize the sort. It saves me a lot of time when I'm looking for investing ideas, right? Looking for what I want to buy. 
filters and scans. Maybe I like a certain, uh, I want to compare apples to apples. This is called finance. So I can look at just insurance. Or I can look at like, uh, you know, uh, down here we got, oh, I don't know, regional banks, you know, stuff like that. So these are called industry groups. These are called sectors, right? Sector industry group. I can filter it down. Just save me a lot of time here. A lot of time, right? Boom. So that is, uh, you know, software. And, you know, this software that I'm showing you now is written by a, a friend of mine. His name, he lives in Chicago. His name's Tom Joseph. Shout out to you, Tom. And uh, Tom's not listening. It's just you and me. So look, here's the thing. Tom, the reason I like him is, you know, I don't sell his stuff personally. But I'll tell you what, look into it because he's not just a software developer. The guy trades. And he's an option trader, so he kind of understands what we look for for cash flow and stuff. So nice software package. Hey, I don't care what software you use. There's some great ones out there. Find what works for you. But don't be cheap. Make sure you spend a little money here. Remember, it's not about price. It's about value. When it comes to my investments, gal, do I want to you know, trust it some cheapo-rama thing? You don't want cheap whiskey. You don't want cheap women. And you certainly don't want cheap software. So make sure you pay uh, a little for at least for the software <laughs> the others I don't know what you're gonna do so there you go so we've been talking about income and expenses and of course the more debt we have there's often payments associated with that and debt is uh, an accelerator right it's not good or bad it simply gets us what we want before um, before we have money for it so if we want health care now uh, we don't want to wait for it till we can collect enough taxes. We borrow money and we spend more than we have. Maybe not as wise, but you know we want people to feel good. Uh, if we want to grow our business, um, we certainly uh, can't always wait for revenues to come in. We say, hey, let's take on a little debt risk. You know, uh, if as long as we're solvent, we'll, you know, our expansion should result in more revenues. And so you can see there's wise debt and unwise debt. Well. What debt is, is, you know, there's, there's debt, there's risk when we go into debt, and we want to make sure we're solvent when we do it. And so a lot of people, you know, do it for consumption, and a lot of people do it for investments. A lot of the debt that I hold is investment debt. For example, I have real estate, but it is solvent, meaning that the income from the real estate pays for the debt. I have a mortgage on the rental property. Let's say the, the let's say the mortgage is like seven hundred dollars and maybe the rent is a thousand. Well that gives me three hundred dollar a month cash flow. That's locked in for thirty years. The rent will likely grow, the payment will likely not. You know, thirty years from now the house will probably be worth more, the rent will probably be charged more, but yet the payment will either disappear from being paid off or remain the same. So that is a that's a very solvent situation. My risk is what? Well, the tenant doesn't pay or the tenant moves out. But as long as I have good fundamentals of the area, and I say, okay, what's the average home worth? What's the average vacancy rate? What's the average rent? Oh, the average rent is 1300 Okay, I'll do mine for 1000 Now my tenant's nervous that I'll actually kick him out, and there's high demand for what I have because I'm giving a good value for the dollar. So, you know, people say, what if someone moves out? Well, if you offer better value than everybody else, then no one wants to move out. And when someone does, you got someone right ready to come in and even pay more. So, so really, you know, I don't look at that as that risky. You know, homes are, uh, you know, are, are something one of the basic necessities of life. And if I'm renting mine a lower price than most people, then and I keep it, you know, in good shape, then people will want to be there. It's very, very simple. A lot less risky, I think, than being out of control and having a job. So I don't mind using debt one bit, as long as the debt is solvent. In other words, the, 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 the program that I'm in is paying for itself and it's making me money rather than, you know, maybe consumer debt is debt that isn't paying for itself. So I don't mind going into debt as long as I have an asset that pays for it, right? Whether it's a, a house or a car or whatever, if I've got an asset that's paying for it, debt's not a problem and it helps me get the things I want faster than if I try to grow my way into them. Imagine if I'd have waited to buy that home, you know, when Marcy and I were, let's say we're earning minimum wage and we want to buy a $200,000 home, how are you going to save $200,000 out of your earnings? You're going to use debt as an accelerator. Problem is what most people do in their personal life is they use debt as an accelerator to buy things that aren't solvent. You know, they, they, we can list all the things they use a credit card for. And so we have, uh, you know, Experian and TransUnion will do a fundamental analysis on someone. That's literally what they do. And they say, hey, based on this person's policies, 
and based on the direction they're going and based on what it looks like they've been doing you know these guys look like they have a policy of using all their debt maxing out these people look like they have a policy of buying only liabilities on you know their their department store credit card um, these guys look like they have a policy of paying late uh, these guys look like they have a policy of, of paying it all off at once you know they look at all these different policies these guys have a policy of getting into massive amounts of debt massive amounts of credit and they use it all uh, these guys have a habit of getting massive amounts of credit but they don't use it as much They're, they have a little more, more meekness power under control so Experian and TransUnion will give you a credit score so so far we've dealt with six different numbers let's let's kinda maybe we could draw some of them maybe let's do this uh, get a maybe a green pen out let's just draw a little financial statement here right like this and so far we've had six numbers we've had income we've had expenses and over here we've put the cash flow usually right income minus expenses cash flow so there's three numbers then we've had the assets we've had the liabilities and what we call the equity or the net worth right so that's one two three four five six numbers we have well we also have something called a credit score and a credit score is given to us by an entity that understands how to do a fundamental analysis so there's seven numbers cash flow income expenses number four assets liabilities number six equity and number seven is a credit rating or a credit score very important part of fundamental analysis and guess what everyone has a personal credit score it, some people might be zero <laughs> Some people, yeah, you got Dun and Bradstreet, Standard & Poor's, Moody's giving corporations and nations credit scores. So again, fundamental analysis occurs on all three levels: Experian, TransUnion, you know, Equifax, whoever they are, doing personal credit scores. So as we look at fundamentals on the personal level, we need to understand how debt and credit score work on on all the levels, actually. I mean, I think we can agree that there are many corporations we study today that were using debt extremely responsibly and profitably and it helped them grow and help them flourish and now they're making billions and billions of dollars. I don't think Steve Jobs makes billions of dollars without going into some type of debt or getting investors or selling off his company or growing in some way. I don't think the United States has used debt very responsibly. But what's the deal? The Federal Reserve, do you think they want you to know about all this stuff? Do you think the powers that be want you to know about these things? I think there's a lot of people rather keep you in ignorance. One of the great moments when I'll teach this to other people is when we talk about the Federal Reserve being private and how they can just simply acquire U.S. bonds by writing a check that they've given power by the government to. No wonder The Creature from Jekyll Island such a popular book no wonder everyone should read it. All of a sudden, these bankers decide they're going to be the Fed, and they can simply buy debt and pay money for the debt and acquire these bonds and put the United States in debt to them, and it's privately done? Boy, that's just, that's just something that most people don't understand. The importance of understanding, monetizing the debt, expanding the balance sheet, the vocabulary, huge, because they, the sovereign debt has uh boy that's a bad bad deal encouraging the going to debt to people that uh you know that aren't part of the government amazing amazing stuff so let's understand what debt is debt's simply when you make a promise it's an agreement hey will you loan me some money i'll pay you back right that's all it is oh i'm in your debt you know i owe you i promise you i'm in your debt i'll get you back i'll take i'll scrub your back sometime if you scratch mine right Credit is power, and to me, this is a very important conversation for you to I have, so I hope you're listening carefully between the two of us. Look, credit is the power to buy things. If I'm an investor, what am I in the business of doing? I'm, in the inter I'm interested in expanding my balance sheet, just like the Federal Reserve is. So look, the Federal Reserve wants to buy what? They want to buy treasuries. Donald Trump wants to do what? He wants to buy real estate. Warren Buffett wants to do what? He wants to buy assets. So if I have an asset column, that's where it starts. I want to build my asset column every day because what's that going to do? That's going to build income, isn't it? That's what it's going to be. I want to focus on my ability to what? My power to buy things. 
Now, I don't care whether I buy things for money I get, you know, from earnings, or if I get it from credit as long as it's solvent. As long as it can pay for itself and the debt, it's a great move. In fact, it's better to buy things on credit, actually, if, if the program that you're buying, the asset that you're buying, can pay the debt off and give you cash flow. Why? Why is that better? Because if all I do is, this is very important, if all I do, whoop, if all I do, let's get that back, if all I do is use my earnings to finance new assets, I can only grow my asset column at the, at the rate that I'm earning at. That's a very slow process if you're making, you know, what if all you can invest is 100 bucks a month right now? And all you can do is buy a hundred dollars worth of stock each month, and the dividend on that small. Uh, hey, I'll tell you what—you're not going to get rich in a, in very appreciable amount of time. You might not even be able to outpace inflation. But if a person will say, "No, I'm going to be responsible," unlike the U.S. government, and I'm going to find a way to find assets that produce enough money that also covers the payment, the expense. There's no limit to how fast I can acquire assets and how fast I can build my cash flow and my return is infinite because I'm not using any of my money. So that's a very important concept I explain in Robert's book on, on the infinite returns. He asked me, can you do this in paper? I says, yeah, you can. And I give an example of how it can be done. So we definitely are a fan of credit. Okay, definitely a fan of that. These guys I'm not a fan of. Here's the Standard & Poor's you know, uh, report. Now watch this. United States of America long-term credit rating lowered. Why? Now outlook negative. Okay. On what? Political risks. What's that? M fiscal and monetary policy, and rising debt burden. This off-balance uh, sheet. You know, having to put in more debt. Standard and Poor sees this. I see it. You see it. Alan Greenspan. What are you whining about? This is not AAA paper. It's a hundred trillion. It's a deficit of one point six. GDP is sluggish. Okay, political, fiscal responsibility, the fiscal policy is all screwed up. No wonder Standard & Poor's does a fundamental analysis and says, you know what, the risk is higher. What is a credit score? It's the risk of loaning someone money. It's the risk of buying a bond. And the risk of buying a bond went up because the GDP's gone down, the debt's gone up because of all these factors. The printing money, the Fed, the whole thing. No wonder Standard & Poor's is ready. Moody's will follow. It's only a matter of time. What is the pattern? Insolvency, delinquency, bankruptcy. And so what do we do to tell the future? We look at what is likely by demographics, policy, and add a little time in. Interesting stuff. Great use of credit by ExxonMobil. What, you're going to build a, a, a billion dollar oil platform digging new technology deeper into the earth ever before out in the Gulf? Can't do that out of earnings. It's not fast enough. We're not buying gas fast enough. So what do you do? Use debt. Okay, Finance it with debt. Use debt as a lever so you can grow faster and if you grow faster that generates even more revenue right that's the game this is triple a paper long-term outlook stable long-term long-term outlook by s p stable here negative negative long-term outlook here stable lots of revenue here deficit here revenue St stable alan greenspan this is what triple a paper looks like Apple has AAA paper, right? AAA credit reading. Why? Look at the debt to GDP ratio here. Debt to our ability to make money. Debt to assets. Debt to cash flow. We got all kinds of cash flow. We can pay this debt. Look at all that cash flow. They can pay that debt. Very cool stuff. This is gross, you know, before a lot of things are taken out, but still good AAA paper. Their bottom line is outlook stable. They haven't had to adjust this since 1999, man. This is today's report. Last time they had to do something, they gave them that rating in 1999. Hasn't changed in, what, 12 years? Stable. People buying oil, using their debt wisely. Not stable. Outlook, stable. So when we look at power, you know, I mean, it's kind of like you know, having a child. You teach people to do it the right way, use that power the right way, or you go see R-rated movies and do it the wrong way. Well, you know, you don't want to cut that power. You just want to teach them to use it the right way. Same with credit. You're cutting the credit cards up? No. If you cut the credit card up, remember. Remember, if we want to change things, we need to have what? Buying power. 
and all we're doing is killing people's buying power when we cut up their credit cards. So really, if I look at my personal financial statement, that's the most important statement we'll talk about today. The most important fundamental analysis we can talk about between the two of us, you and I, is, is your personal financial statement. Are you operating at a deficit? Is your net worth negative? You know, are, is, your, is your income relying on a job? Are you having to make payments for mortgages, loans, and taxes? Is your credit poor? These are the seven numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right here. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the thing we're looking at. So if a person wants to change their financial life, they start by looking at these seven numbers and they say, okay, which one can we improve? Should we work on our deficit? If we should, how do we do it? Do we do it by cutting expenses? Do I do it by earning income? And if I'm going to earn income, what's my policy? Is my policy to get a second job? Is my policy to clip coupons and, and cut expenses or quit buying less or lower my standard of living? Right? Is it my net worth I'm worried about? Should I pay down these debts or should I buy assets? To, you know, what is your policy? Should I try to do it for money from a job or should I increase credit where I can buy the assets quicker? So these are the questions we need to ask. You know, we want a surplus. We want passive income. We want net worth. People that are rich have high limits and an excellent credit history. They keep their promises. They use credit. So there's lots of different voices to listen to. You know, and I said I wouldn't mention Susie Orman and David Ramsey, but the fact of the matter is they're always screaming for people to get out of debt or get a better job. You know, the school number one says get a job. Well, that's focusing on increasing income. You know, I don't know that that really helps the long-term issue of what? Expenses. You got food, clothing, health. Well, if I'm going to work as a job as a source of my income, you know, I'm always going to have to have a job to make my payments on food, clothing, shelter. So I don't know if getting a job is a good idea. You know, some people say, like Dave Ramsey, act your wage. Well, I don't like that idea because now I have to live under the standard of my job which means my job will dictate my happiness. Everything I do in my life will have now be under the umbrella and limitation of a job. And, and, and if my job is not an abundant thing, then I can't have abundance. And I have to do things like clipping coupons and, and, and going without and you know getting big pens instead of Mont Blanc pens. And it reduces my standard of living. It's a goal to live smaller. You know, I don't like that idea. And, and, and those are the two major things. You know, get a second job, get two incomes, put your wife to work, put your husband to work, you know, cut payments, try to get out of debt, try to pay all this stuff off. Actually, I think there's a better way. If you get power and educated, look, what is buying an asset about? You've got to have two things if you want to fill this asset column. I'll write down what they are right now. There are two things you need to build this asset column. Number one you need power to buy. So we'll call it not British Petroleum, not Broken Pipe, buying power. And that means increasing credit. The second thing we need is you need financial education. So when you see an opportunity, you know whether it will be solvent or not, whether it's good or not. And if you see the opportunity as solvent, it, you just need the buying power. But if you have no education, you'll buy the wrong stuff. And if you have the right education but no income, you'll, you won't be able to buy the opportunity. So the key, I think, to growing your asset column is knowledge and buying power. And, and that's my policy in my family is we're focusing on our knowledge and focusing on our buying power because then there's no limit to the assets we can build. That's, that's, the, that's the one that I want. And you can need to make your own decisions, you know, if, if you want to get another job or if you want to act your wage and clip coupons. But I think actually instead of cutting up credit cards, you know, I think, you, A, you increase your education, which you're doing now. And I hope you can feel that. I hope you feel the time has been well spent. I hope you feel that, my gosh, I just did learn some things. I just became, uh, you know, a higher IQ financially. You know, we can read lots and lots of books, you know, and, and we don't tend to, to remember them. You know, the seven habits of highly effective people. Did you like it? Yeah. We'll name the seven habits. Go right now. Do it. Name them if it was so good. You know, even my friend Robert and Kim will tell you this. You read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. There's six lessons in Rich Dad, Poor Dad in order. Name all six. You know, it, it's just interesting. And, and the reason I, my goal 
was to provide classes where people could start to learn you know, education. What are the four pillars? Fundamental analysis, technical analysis, cash flow. And, and my goal working with you is to do more and more and more classes just like this to where at the end, you know, you feel you have some specifics. You feel like, okay, I just made some progress in my financial education. I understand it better than I did before. I'm going to review this over and over. So I say get educated. I say let's get my white uh, marker out here. I say get educated right there. And then I say build your buying power with credit and use that credit to buy assets that pay for themselves to develop a passive income where the job we don't need a job man no no more job and that I think is the key to getting uh, rid of a job is to do a what let's get rid of this is to do a personal fundamental analysis see which of those seven numbers needs to be buoyed up some people say get rid of the seventh number don't go into debt at all I disagree I think it's part of the way corporations do it if you want to run your life like a business, then you're going to do what businesses do, and businesses use debt in in a proper way. So, you know, there is. Uh, so, you know, we just finished, uh, you know, fundamental analysis, and uh, again, I hope you found tremendous value. What we're going to do next is we're going to move on now to technical analysis. Today, we talked about the strength of an entity, right? What makes it valuable. Okay, next we're going to talk about the strength of the market, what drives these stock prices up, right? And then uh, we'll get to cash flow, we'll get to risk management, but next on the list, technical analysis. If you enjoyed this one, boy, you're really going to enjoy this one. It's awesome, awesome stuff, so very cool. Also, we made some progress. Hopefully, you became aware of some new things. If you were a beginner, perhaps you learned about the Federal Reserve, you're aware of that, with inflation, uh, printing money, fiat currencies, P.E. ratios, right? Debt, all these types of things, you know, debt to GDP, you know, what the bond market is. Boy, did we cover some ground? Holy cow, I think we did. So we're in phase one, and I'm excited. You know, we'll do we'll do three more classes in phase one, and then I'm gonna you know show you how you can move into some of the advanced courses. And you know, I have uh, some wonderful friends that help uh, with this area. And you know, these right here, you know, we spend a little time these. Oh, we can oh we can get so detailed. And then, of course, the ultimate goal is if you just keep doing what you're doing now, I'm telling you, we'll just take you by the hand, go all the way through, and eventually you get to the point where uh, there's proficiency. But I hope you feel you're making great progress. Hey, congratulations. You and I, we just made it through together. I'm going to keep holding your hand. I'm going to keep walking you through. I'm always going to be there and uh, committed to your financial success. Congratulations. You and I together have just completed basic fundamental analysis. Great job. Look forward to seeing the technicals class. Awesome.